Welcome to Sector Report. I'm David Beetson. This week, what makes farming one of New Zealand's most dangerous occupations, why the campaign to keep the Crafer farms in Kiwi hands continues, and how hard is it in the world's capital of sheep shearing to keep the young guns on the job? What well, we've got to see in the careers days and that actually putting it in as a career rather than just something that maybe um, the guys that don't like doing schoolwork want to do, you know. When it comes to sheep shearing, Kiwis are the best in the world. This year, Ivan Scott broke a 16-year-old world record, clipping 749 lambs in eight hours. Kerry Jo Tahuia set a new women's record, 509 lambs in eight hours. And next month, the World Shearing Championships are being staged in Masterton. There's even talk of turning shearing into an Olympic sport. But our rural affairs correspondent, Drew Chapel has been down to Tikawiti, the world capital of sheep shearing, to find out why it's so hard to find a young shearer these days. It's 5am and almost everyone here in the King Country is still in bed. Almost, but not quite all. If you're looking at New Zealand statistically, sheep rule this country. They outnumber us nearly 10 to 1, 40 million at last count, and occupy more than 8 million hectares of our land. Nothing else even comes close. With sheep of course comes wool, and the shearing season accounts for much of that. We export nearly 200,000 tonnes of clean wool, some for clothes but most for other textiles, at a value of more than a billion dollars. But before any of it can generate revenue for the country, it has to be taken off, and that's where these guys come in. A gang like the one behind me here will work for eight hours a day producing more than three tonnes of wool from 1,200 to sometimes more than 2,000 sheep in a single day. Surely one of the busiest barbershops in the world. Working to a tight schedule, thousands of skilled shearers work long, tiring days, sometimes in uncomfortably hot wool sheds around the country, in two main bursts every year. It's been a huge part of our farming culture for more than one and a half centuries, and recently has hit something of a purple patch. New Zealand's a training ground for everywhere really, because we've got the numbers here. And we'll see the numbers start edging upward again. I think we've probably gone off our low, you know, with the money we can make off a uh, ewe that's rearing 140% lambing. Well, it, it's, good. it's good money now, so we'll see a few more ewes ticking around, I think. Mickey McDonald is somewhat of an old hand at the sharing game, a former world champion who now runs this 1800 hectare land court property to Farua Station near Tomaranui. Mickey McDonald knows the trend over the last 25 odd years has been a steep decline in the relative price of wool exports. Between 1989 and 2011, they've fallen nearly 50% in value. He says we could well be seeing the start of a new golden era for wool. The lambs that the guys are shearing, you know, they're worth 130, 140 bucks easy. And, you know, there's, there's probably eight bucks worth of wool on them. And, you know, so there's, there's definitely profit now, which is good rather than just doing it for animal health. And um, it's become a bit of a chore, really. So, yeah. So I guess, yeah, with a with raw product the way it is, we've got to sort of get back on song with... Uh, getting it sorted properly and show a bit more passion towards it. Despite changes in international markets as well as improvements in breeding technology, the practical side of sheep farming and shearing is almost identical to how it has always been, reliant on the skills of farmers and their dogs. It's still the same, basic, the basic techniques the same. Um, I can't see it changing. I mean, 20 years ago they were talking about a robot taking over from us then. Well, I haven't seen him turn up for work yet, so I think, I think these fellas' jobs are safe for a while yet. Though the job may not have changed much, the prospects certainly have. A good shearer now has the opportunity to travel the world, earning pounds, euros and Australian dollars in greater quantities than they are able to here. Been to Wales, England, Scotland, Italy and Australia. The last few years has just been sort of see the world a bit and share a few sheep, have a bit of fun yeah. and make a bit of money at the same time. Yeah. 
You could say shearing runs in the blood. With an ex-champion shearer for a dad, Jock McDonald has followed in his father's footsteps, appearing in open class competitions around the country after just six years in the trade. Despite not being under the harsh glare of the competitive spotlight though, Jock says the principles of on-farm shearing are much the same. In the competitions they judge you on how many second cuts you're doing on the board there and like that's when you cut the wool in half so you get pinged every time you do that and then they judge it out the back for any cuts and stuff like that and any wool left on so in the shed you don't have no judges you got to keep the job pretty right in the shed too else the farmer doesn't like it too much but keeping young talents like jock in kiwi wool sheds is another challenge the industry here faces that worries shearing contractor Mark Barrowcliffe, who says with no financial incentive to stay, many are being lured to Australia, where longer days and a stronger dollar await. New Zealand's been hit hard with the sheep numbers dropping, so instead of going to a farmer's um, shed for say like 1,200 ewes, he might only have 1,000, so suddenly instead of eight hours work he might only do six, and that hits the guys at the end of the day, because they're only sort of doing a lot of short days, whereas Australia you've got a lot better weather, and you can go to a shed for four or five days, and every day is full. Mark believes the secret to retaining our top talent and building the wool industry back up to where it was in the 80s lies in improving what we offer to wool buying nations around the world, as well as uniting the New Zealand sharing body. We're trying to um, add value to our clients and just group together the professionalism we've got in the wool shed here that really no one knows about. We do it day in and day out and, and we're, we're putting a brand on that and giving it um, a bit more marketing power overseas. There is the New Zealand Shearing Contractors Association that, that does a lot of work in, in promoting the industry and, and, and does a good job but this is just taking that the next step further and giving the wool exporters and that a, a marketable brand to, to push onwards and upwards overseas. But for some shearers like Jock, it is possible to have the best of both worlds earning money overseas and returning home for the peak season. I'll probably stay here till around the King Country till um, end of January and then go down the South Island and do a month or two down there. Yeah. Sort of steadies off there for a while and then in May it will kick off the um, winter shearing with the cover combs yeah. Yeah, and it gets pretty busy but I head back over to the UK then. So. Sharing is without a doubt gruelling work, physically and mentally demanding, and only a special type of person will make a success of it as a career. One of those who has, and at the highest level, suggests there should be plenty more to follow in his footsteps. What we've got to see in the education um, back at school is like in the careers days and that actually putting it in as a career rather than just something that maybe um, the guys that don't like doing schoolwork want to do, you know. It's an awesome career, good sport, you can travel the world, you can do, you know, make a good income on the way and meet a lot of people, make a lot of friends, so yeah, it's a good job. Drew Chappell reporting from Tikawiti. Coming next, the campaign to keep the Crafer Farms in Kiwi hands hasn't given up the battle. Welcome back to Sector Report. The Crayfar Farm Purchase Group has had its day in court, but the judge has reserved his decision on their challenge against the official approvals given for the sale of Alan Crayfar's 16 dairy farms to a subsidiary of the Shanghai Pengjin Group. The Farm Purchase Group is battling to keep the farms in New Zealand hands, and it wants much more transparency about the process followed by the Overseas Investment Office and government ministers when they consider foreign land purchases. Win or lose the current Crayfar case, will the group continue the battle? The Crayfar Farm Purchase Group spokesman, Alan MacDonald, joins us now. Welcome, Alan. Now, what's actually been driving the farm group? The, the specific purchase or is it broader issues concerning how the government and the OIO handle these applications? Well, I think it's become a combination of all three of those, David. We, we started off, the group came together um, to look at just buying the farms. 
and uh, as we went through that process, it became abundantly clear to the buyers who I've got. You know, they're all local farmers. Uh, half of these properties are basically over somebody's back fence. In the case of Iwi, they've had long links to these these farms. Just tell me who the group is, because we know about Michael Fay. Everybody knows about Michael yeah, well, Fay, but there are others. Yeah, I think unfortunately Michael's probably a bit of a distraction, but. Um, <laughs> You know, we, when we started off, we came to the party quite late and we wanted an air of credibility about this because there's been a few tyre kickers around the Crafer Farms and uh, you could describe Michael as many things, but a tyre kicker ain't one of them. Uh, so there's, ten, there's actually 10 buyers in the group uh, and no more than two farms wanted by any one buyer. In fact, Michael only wants two and he's not even the biggest investor. So they're all uh, local farmers, Central North Island farmers, some from around Taupo, a couple of iwi groups, uh, the Holmes family, which is, I think, third generation farmer in the bay, that sort of thing. So they're all you know, long-term farmers. And, and they don't actually intend to farm them as a group? No, no. Um, the, they're going to farm the, the, the deal, with well, The way the deal's structured, yeah. because as you're probably aware, the receivers isn't, have insisted on selling them as one package. Yeah. And if they'd been individual farms, they all would have sold you know, two years ago. Um, and in fact, one of our guys is on his third go at trying to buy these farms. That's one of the iwi buyers. So what will happen is that the group has come together basically to fit that prescriptive process um, and then they've all got their names beside a farm or two and when the deal's done they'll all go off and farm the farms individually. Well, well tell me, you've gone to a lot of trouble and you're still going to a lot of trouble. And why didn't you simply end the argument by upping the ante and, and raising your bid? Uh, well these guys are local farmers. They know the value of a dairy farm and you know, 171 and a half, it's 21 and a half more than Landcorp, our national farmer bid for the same package of farms. Um, the valuations that were around two years ago are no longer current. The farms by any measure are not at top production. Uh, they need restocking, they need more investment and at $32.50 roughly for the dairy units, there are non-dairy units in there as well, that's right at the top of the market. So 171 and a half, the guys feel is on the knocker. What kind of difficulties did you encounter in trying to challenge that foreign buyer rival group? Well, I think um, if we start with the, the wider issue, which is this overseas ownership, and um, uh, all, the, all the buyers, as I've said, are local, <coughs> and they just feel that productive farming land shouldn't be going out the door at the rate that it is. In fact, some of them would say it shouldn't be sold overseas at all. So that was the first thing that really struck a chord, because as we went through this process, what you find is that the OIO approves these things, and they go out the door, you might see them notified or gazetted a month after the decision's made, but there's no transparency around it. There's, um, there's no visibility in the transactions, there's no ability to see the applications, and there's actually no physical process for someone who objects to them or may have a view on, on the overseas sale to get involved. And it's that lack of transparency that I think probably motivated a few of the guys. They, they had that underlying thing about not wanting overseas sales. But then the, the lack of transparency around this, the difficulty getting information. Um, you know, we've put in Official Information Act requests, we've been polite, we've asked for information, and we get the standard, oh, you know, commercial sensitivity, we can't do that. At one point they came back to us and said, oh, look, I'm sorry, we're moving offices today, and it's a public holiday in Wellington on Monday, so we can't find the file. I thought gliding on went out in about the 70s or the 80s. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the world. Uh, well, look, yeah, we, we now know what they've decided mm. uh, and what they've recommended to the government. Uh, what's your opinion of the conditions that have been placed on the transaction? Well, they're pretty meaningless and, and quite political, to be honest. I mean, 15 million uh, investment on the farms, that won't even cover restocking the 8,000 cows that have gone off. I think cows are around 2,000 a head at the moment. Might be slightly less, slightly more. Mm. So that's 16 million for a start. So there's your 15 million gone. That's meaningless. Um, a training academy, um, the various ag ITOs, um, Massey, Dairy New Zealand, and um, Lincoln would probably all have a view about their expertise in the training field. Um, uh, walking access, that's just a political sop. Uh, I think if I was the, the buyer in this case, I'd be insulted about having to sign a good behaviour bond. That just smacks of a political um, solution to the May Wang question, mm. really. Do you agree with the notion of conditions on the sale of, of uh, farmland to uh, foreign buyers? Well, it, it sounds like a nice idea, but there's no one to enforce them. OK, because um, I was going to ask you, if we're going to have conditions on sales to foreign buyers of uh, major farm land uh, complexes, why not for Kiwi purchases too? <laughs> Well, I think our 
Kiwi advantage, for want of a better term, is, is in the fact that we are so good at, at farming and, and producing things off our land. That's, that's always been the thing we've been best at. And there, were, there was talk years ago of it being a bit of a sunset industry and all that sort of thing. Now we're in almost a perfect storm of circumstances where the worldwide demand for our products is on the rise. Um, you can't make more agricultural land. Um, you can irrigate it and that brings its own problems. But you can't create more farmland and our farmers are the best in the world, our dairy farmers are the best in the world. Fonterra is universally regarded as, as about the best at what it does. They've got great contacts into China. I mean, they've got hugely successful businesses up there. Yes, we may get some additional support for um, some additional contacts, but the actual marketing is going to fall back on the people here or the people employed by the people that know what they're doing. And that's Fonterra and our other dairy companies. Now, win or lose in, in this particular case, will the group keep on campaigning? Uh, I think it's it's probably a little early to go there, David. We're, uh, it's something that's been discussed, but certainly no decisions have been made around that. But, I mean, these broader issues uh, will remain there? Yeah, They'll the, crop up again in the event yeah, of any the, the other foreign land purchase? I, I, think, you know, I think we've probably touched a chord with New Zealanders. All the polling shows that. And I think even the government has acknowledged that there's a point at which it might become too much. So perhaps the time for that discussion is now, because the, the, the huge concern is the aggravation, uh, sorry, aggregation of, of land. And yes, it's, it's a small proportion at the moment, but it's increasing. And, and how far do we want to go? How much is too much? Um, when, do, when or do we want to put a stop to it? Can we have a tradable block within, you know, it might be 2%, 5%, and that's freely traded backwards and forwards. And then you get into this other question about vertical integration, which I think is a real concern. It sounds like a row that, a row that has very long legs. Oh, I think you're absolutely right there, David. <laughs> Alan MacDonald, thanks very much. Thank you. Alan MacDonald, spokesperson for the Crayfar Farm Purchase Group. Now, if you want to know why farming is one of the most dangerous occupations in the country, stay with us on Sector Report. What's making the New Zealand farm one of the most dangerous workplaces in the country? Every 28 minutes a New Zealand farmer is injured on the job and every 23 days a farmer dies from a work-related accident. But exactly what's known about the factors behind the farm sector's appalling record of injuries and fatalities. The Accident Compensation Commission has mounted a study to find out and here's ACC's Injury Prevention and Management Controller David Holmes to tell us what they've discovered. David, welcome. This record, one injury every 28 minutes, a fatality every 23 days. I mean, is there any other area of, of activity or, or industry in the country which has a record like that? Well, it is terrible, David. Um, however, if we take out of the equation that uh, tragic events at Pike River and look at industry in general, uh, we see that the agricultural sector has four times the number of fatalities that the next highest one does. This is according to the Department of Lab Labor St Statistics. Four times. Four times higher than construction, which is the next highest one. What would you do uh, to another industry that had a record like that? Well, <laughs> we certainly uh, would be working very, very closely with them uh, and, uh, and encouraging them, working with their associations, trying to work with individuals. And there are a number of things that uh, ACC I, is doing. I'll come back to that yeah. in a minute. But let's, get, let's just get some of these statistics out. In terms sure. of cost, for instance, uh, what, what are farm sector accidents costing ACC currently? Well, I think the first thing we should understand is that uh, the cost isn't really ACC's cost. Uh, the cost is to the levy payer in that sector. So we're talking about farmers <coughs> who pay the levy, uh, which covers the, the cost of injuries and fatalities within their industry. So, All right, so, so how much how much is the levy paying mm. is actually being spent dealing with the consequences of accidents? If we look at uh, the cost in 2010, we're looking around about 51 million a year. There is some good news here. I've got to tell you that too, because last year the costs were actually around about 45 million. So we're going down, and that reflects. Uh, some good work done by the industry, by fa individual farmers and by their associations like Federated Farmers and so on. Like that. Okay. Are most of the injuries or deaths occurring while farmers are working on their farms and 
when they're working alone or when they're working with others or what? Do you, what do you know about the, about the actual pattern That's actually of a very the good injuries? question. Uh, best practice would indicate that um, farmers who are working with others have lower uh, injury rates than if they are working alone. Uh, and a number of studies, for example, the human factors uh, causation model would uh, indicate that that would be so as well. So if farmers working by themselves, they're more likely to have an injury than if they're working uh, with a group of people. And are there, have you identified times of day or times of year when, when accident rates are likely to be high? According to the Department of Labor st statistics, summertime appears to be uh, a time where they have a high number of injuries and in the beginning of the day rather than the latter part of the day, mm -hmm. which is rather interesting, you'd say. If it's at the beginning of the day, it's not fatigue. It's, well, you wouldn't think it was fatigue. But have you been able to actually work out whether there are you know, real human factors like that at play? There are a number of things. Indeed, fatigue is a factor at certain times of the year. If we take, for example, the calving season in the dairy industry, uh, farmers are often up all times of the night and day taking care of the, the calving process. Uh, and in a study, uh, a, a research paper that myself and one of my colleagues, uh, Lisa Taylor, did, uh, we found that fatigue at that time of year was very high. Uh, it's just the recognition of that that is often a, a problem amongst farmers. But there are other things like there are environmental issues, there's the terrain as well that farmers work on. Uh, there's also our own sort of uh, thinking around that Kiwi can-do attitude, uh, that uh, a certain risk taking, um, inexperience probably in, in some factors, especially around machinery and new types of machinery, that sort of thing. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, have, can, can you actually track the pattern so that you can see what the high-risk areas and the high-risk activities are? According to the accident statistics, we would say, uh, and if we just take injuries rather than fatalities, we take uh, uh, that large animal uh, injuries are probably the highest. We're talking around about 29%. By that you mean an animal actually uh, crushing or, or, yeah, or stepping on that's or, right. or <laughs> stomping on those or sorts something. Of things, uh, uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Around about the same level of uh, injuries, slightly lower, is to do with machinery. So we're talking about like quad bikes, tractors, and other pieces of, of farm machinery. Uh, then we have um, strains and strains and spraying like lifting and hay bales and that sort of thing and then also surprisingly for many people is um, about noise workplace noise particularly in like milking sheds that sort of thing mm -hmm. uh, working uh, in close proximity so they can't hear a hazard well that can be the, the outcome that, or, or, or is it that they're actually losing their hearing they're losing their hearing okay yeah one of your jobs obviously is, is to design prevention and safety pro safety promotion programs mm. how many of these actually target farmers You'll be aware that there's a strong emphasis on quad bikes at the uh, moment. Yes, I do. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and that's the reason because the number of deaths that are happening. We're talking about five deaths directly related to quad bikes on farms, farmers doing farming work a year. We're talking about 180 injuries. Uh, some of them are serious, so the farm will never work here uh, again. However, there are other uh, initiatives too that ACC has taken up. For example, large animal handling techniques, how to... Uh, prevent and, and reduce the number of injuries with ha handling large animals. There's tractor safety that we're doing. Uh, there's fatigue is another issue we're dealing with. And also uh, child safety on farms. One of the tools you have, which can either be a carrot or a stick, is of course the levy. True. Do you, have you, are you employing levy differentials to reward the safe zones of agriculture and put the levy load well, well, yes, we are. On the safety, or on the less safe yes. zones. There are several discount schemes that ACC runs for uh, good practice and best practice in terms of health and safety on farms. Uh, they carry uh, for a self-employed person and uh, one employing just up to 10 people, we have what we call our safety discount scheme. We have uh, what we call the experience rating scheme, which has just come in, that looks at if, uh, if a farmer has a low number of injuries, well, then we will reward him with a percentage and the minister of the day, which was Nick, Nick Smith at the time, he said there's a potential of up to 50% reduction in the amount of levies that are charged. Uh, 
But um, you're going to see. Yes, yes. I okay. don't know about the fifty percent thing, but uh, yeah. But You've opened up a whole new ball game, we have indeed. which we will deal with, yeah. I think, in more depth at some other yeah. time. But thank you, David Holmes, very much. Thank you very much, David. ACC Injury Prevention and Management Controller David Holmes. And that's all for this week. Remember, you can catch this show again anytime online at country99tv.co.nz. Thanks for your company. I'm David Beetson for Sector Report. See you next week.